All right, uh, we'll get cracking here, folks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Writers Read. We are coming to you live from Concordia University's fourth space and would like to begin by acknowledging that we are located on unceded indigenous lands. The Kanyankahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather. Jage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations, and today it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. As I mentioned, we are coming live to you from Concordia's fourth space. Uh, you might be wondering, what is fourth space? Well, it's where we facilitate daily activities that allow for knowledge sharing by focusing on what Concordia community members and their collaborators are working on in terms of research uh, initiatives and course activities. So welcome in to the space today, whether you're here in person or joining us over Zoom. We are in a webinar, of course, over Zoom, so I'll remind you that if you'd like to engage with our speakers today, we invite you either to raise a virtual hand and we'll go ahead and unmute you so that we can hear you, so that you can speak, or of course, there's the EverTrusty Q&A box. If you're more of a texter and want to pop in some questions or comments, the chat is also ac activated. For those of you listening to me, behind me or on the sides in the space itself. We have set up a little speaker's corner for you, which is in this direction that I'm pointing. You'll see a screen and a microphone over there. So if you have a question or comment, we'll invite you to go ahead, stand up, walk over to that screen, uh, use the mic that's provided there for you so that the folks on Zoom can hear you. You're welcome to unmask in that moment if you are comfortable doing so um, and, and engage in that way. Okay, that's it for me, read the housekeeping. So it's on that note that I'll pass things over to Sina Kira. Hi, Sina. Hi, welcome. Yes, my name is Sina. Thank you for saying that and reminding me to say it. <laughs> my name is Sina Kara, and um, I'm happy to be here and welcome you to the first event of the 2021-22 series of Writers Read. And thank you to the Force Space for your generosity and skill in making today's event possible. It's a beautiful space and I'm happy to be here. Um, very happy actually. And I need to thank before I go on, the Dean of Arts and Sciences for ongoing support for this series. I took on the mantle of curating uh, Writers Read 10 years ago last month, just two weeks after my partner gave birth to twins um, and the week, the very same week that my first and only novel was published. Um, I mentioned that because those early years were <laughs> such a blur, kind of like the last year and a half have been actually. But, um, but I've loved every one of those events and I'm grateful to have hosted uh, guests that included a long dream of writers I wanted to meet, Lydia Davis, Ray Armand Trout, Dory Graham, Claudia Rankine, and honoring writers that I really admire, such as Dion Brand, Gail Scott, Nicole Brassard, Lisa Robertson, C.A. Conrad, Chris Krauss, Madeline Kien, Roxanne Gay, Ben Lerner, Brenda Hillman, Robert Haas, Renee Gladman, Eileen Miles, um, and on. But I also want to say that um, while the guests have been a true highlight of the series over the years, the actual time spent in rooms, various rooms, with the students, uh, the incredible students that we've had over this past 10 years has been really uh, a true and rare gift. And I wanna thank uh, each of those students who've come today and have come over the years, because I think we've been basking in these incredible reading and tending and creating this space together for all this time. And it has been truly special. Um, I also wanna thank uh, my assistants. I've had a good fortune of uh, 10 assistants. Uh, including uh, Sarah Burgoyne, Deanna Fong, Kathleen, and this year, Emily Zuberic, young poets whose talent and commitment to poetry have made this job uh, a pleasure. And as for stellar guests, today's no exception, hosting these two writers, Alicia Stallings in Athens and Karen Soli in Newfoundland, even if only on the same screen, has been an idea I've yearned to make possible for several years. I've had the pleasure of hosting uh, Karen Soli 
winner of the Griffin Prize for Poetry, finalist for the T.S. Eliot Award. And a poet, I have to say, rarely and unanimously adored in her own country um, and beyond, but uh, in her own country. I have hosted her on more than one occasion, but A. Stallings, a poet widely recognized as the most gifted formalist of her generation, who is translated in rhyming 14ers, Lucretius, The Nature of Things, who's been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize and been a Guggenheim Fellow and a Spelling Bee Queen, um, remains a much admired, admired poet that I've glimpsed only through lines of verse and ongoing peacock tweets until today. So this season, we're thinking of transformation and adaptation, both of which depend on art that expands and extends the boundaries of our thinking. And, and I just want to say that this has been my desire these 10 years with Writers Read, to bring together voices from far corners of our literary worlds, geographically and sometimes aesthetically, in conversations together that, sorry, that together create new spaces and new possibilities. So the pressure, of course, <laughs> But now I turn, I turn the space over to our guests who um, each poet will read for approximately 10 to 12 minutes before turning into a conversation and we hope a question or two from the audience. So please help me welcome Karen Soley and Alicia Stalling. And Karen, you will be first to read. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's uh, it's really it's great to be here, there, um, wherever we are. Um, so uh, thank you very much, um, Zina, for having me, and I'm I'm thrilled to be part of of this series with Alicia, who is a poet I've long admired, and um, to be part of the the legacy of this amazing series. Um, I'm just going to read a handful of poems from. From the Capely Caves, which is my um, latest book, and um, the book is set on the coast of Fife in Scotland, and a kind of central figure of the book is a is a um, seventh century hermit called Saint Etherne, and there are passages in the book that um, sort of speak through a figure inspired by his withdrawal to the Capely Caves in order to attempt to make a decision whether to establish a priory on May Island, which was directly across from the caves, or to remain in the caves and pursue a life of solitude. The poems I'm going to read are poems that, that are um, not in that voice, but sort of uh, take up some of the concerns that uh, would have influenced his time in the caves. Um, uh, devotion, certainly, and um, religion. Uh, seventh century was sort of the second wave of Christian colonialism in Britain. Um, pressures of war and work and the natural world. So um, one, of the, one of the preoccupations of the book is how, how these forces recur over time and, um, and the parallels between between how these forces operate over time. Another preoccupation is, this, is this, the prospect and the specter of error in making decisions that affect not only our own lives, but the lives of others. The first poem I'm, I'm gonna read is, is called The Desert Fathers. And um, it is uh, sort of set in two places at once. Um, one is the third century, uh, um, settlements of hermits, um, among whom were, were hermits called the Desert Fathers, St. Jerome, Abba Moses, um, St. Anthony. And um, the situation of uh, the desert, desert Fathers was one that, that parallels communities of retreat through the ages, people who gather in places who may be devoutly religious, who may, as is in the case of the community of the Desert Fathers be drawn there, not necessarily through religion, but through an attraction to um, a life of contemplative solitude. People went there who were cur simply curious, um, people who uh, were running from something, or people who simply had nowhere else to go and were taken in by this community. 
there are parallels with a community in the Mojave Desert called uh, Slab City in California. And um, so uh, this poem moves between those, those two communities. Um, and if, if you go online, you can find Leonard Knight's Salvation Mountain. So this is the Desert Fathers. With or without a bindle of crystal meth, they made their anchorage in Egypt's Wadi El Natrun, or the dismantled Marine Corps training base of Slab City, California. Hard skills in transition, taking losses and burning, if not with a sensible fire, in the pride of specialized knowledge. Snake Man relocates the red diamond rattlesnake and northern Mojave rattlesnake from residents' trailers to his own to live alongside him with the scorpions and guard dogs. It's tough to have riches and not love them. St. Anthony sold his land, gave the money to the poor, yet in his outer mountain sanctuary cried, I desire peace, but these bad thoughts will not leave me all burned in body, in contemplation, as the lonely burn, a musical state. The brethren assemble for a meal, or from the last free place in America, watch the Navy at war games bombing the chocolate mountains. But Snake Man prefers to exercise his hobbies, salvaging undetonated shells, pointing guns at people, antagonizing snowbirds, and short-term RVers communally parked near the East Jesus Sculpture Garden and preaching the ethics of solitude. By vocation or necessity, the future transforms in the heat of the impartial desert. Tourists and scholars of human interest from villages along the Nile or funneled through Nyland, which the census grudgingly designates a place, seek insight, but wish someone would do something about the trash. Leonard Knight's Salvation Mountain beckons in three-story robes of multicolored latex. He clocked in with a half bag of cement and some paint and kept at it for 26 years. But just as Anthony decamped to his inner mountain, so Leonard did to the El Dorado care home and even the tattooed hermit of the Isle of Skye took up a flat in Broadford. A cell can teach you everything. All it asks is you give it your mind. Snake man wars against the body that would destroy his spirit. Someday, he says, I will be all flame. I have long been interested in writing about work and how work affects an experience of place. And um, this next poem is uh, spoken, I suppose, in, in the voice of a trawlerman who fished the, the um, Firth of Forth in, uh, on the coast of Fife um, between the wars. And um, there are a couple of things here that I guess are useful to know. Um, Aidan is the first Bishop of Lindisfarne. Uh, the Hakes are fishing grounds in the Firth and the Black Squad were the people who ran the engines and the boilers on trawlers. So this is called a trawlerman. The sea is neither animal nor God, won't be tamed or appeased. Aidan gave his young priest oil to calm the waves, but myth is most useful when it rouses a body to work harder. Body, spirit, fire, and water, having been absorbed into the world of commerce in which even seabirds participate. Their convergence, a sign of herring in the hakes. Profit unites great distances, yet its heart beats inside us. But Evelyn, whatever counts me truly among the living resides with you. The rest, just perseverance and good gear. Ran 30 minutes from Fife Ness, all nets shot by nine, sky looks like wind. Soon, heavy swell, 
the underwater cables writhing, this foul coastline laced in wrecks. We'll take tea with the Black Squad while we can, and your fine bread, Evelyn. The 38 winter herring overspilled box and barrel, silvered the piers at St. Monin's, and the market so strong, fish girl's fingernails dissolved in brine. No one can predict how herring run. They are a tender species, easily influenced. It was luck brought them in, with money circulating freely as the Germans prepared for war. There are several poems in the book that look at some of the stories and myths associated with religious figures and, and hermits um, in, in the area of, Scot of that area of Scotland. And this one uh, takes off from a story that, that um, inspires the poem previous to it, which was the story of um, St. Kentigern, who went on to become the patron saint of Scotland. So the story goes that uh, Kentigern's mother was tossed off Lepreian law, a Trepean law by her father um, for the crime of becoming pregnant. Um, she survived that fall, so they cast her adrift in the Firth of Forth to meet her fate. She washed up on um, the shore at Culross where she gave birth to Kentigern, who was taken in then by St. Servanus into his nearby teaching monastery. So um, the, the boys of that monastery were less than thrilled that uh, this newcomer had, had arrived to, um, to uh, take up all the attention and affection of Servanus, which they, um, they prized for their own. So they decided to get a bit of revenge. So this poem is called Kentigern and the Robin. A fine day to be cruel. Sunny, with a breeze to carry their laughter smoke across the cloister. The rot budding at the core of their energies, they diagnosed as Servanus's fondness for Kentigern, who'd washed up on the beach at Culross like trash in the barrel of his mother to steal the affection entitled them. Hatred is a plotting emotion and gleefully inclusive. Also irksome, the more they discussed it, Servanus's love for his pet Robin, a stupid thing so trusting it would eat from his hand. Killing it was a way to toss their disappointment off an overpass without dying, to give up using another's life. To blame the bastard killed three birds in one. A person can't just do nothing. Into the broken little body, Kentigern poured a scant ounce of his spirit. Into the vacuum left behind rolled a pebble from the afterworld. I thought as much, Servanus said, and summoned the novitiates. See, this boy is above you. To him, the standard does not apply. Through this address, the robin sang. Through prayers, chores, classes, meals, through late mass and into the night, it sang to young men with their heads in their hands, to the knowledge of what they'd done with their ability to do so. Unwound its voice like a rope into the place it had been, where all communication is one way. But a part of it wouldn't be called back. The robin never flew again, bound as it was to Kentigern by its debt. So I'll finish off by um, reading a poem that, that is close to the beginning of the book. And it's set, some of the poems in the book are set uh, sort of in my own experience, um, bumbling around on the coast of Fife, trying to figure out what I was doing with this book. Um, for a long time, I, I did not. I did not really know. So um, this is called a plenitude. Appearing as though they originate in spiritual rather than material seed, as proof 
we don't know how to properly celebrate or mourn. Bindweed and oxeye daisy, crane's bill, harebell, hare's foot clover, whose ideology is fragrant and sticky. The underside of reflection blooming across centuries. Arguments for and against belief, volunteering in equal profusion. My many regrets have become the great passion of my life. One may also grow fond of what there isn't much of, grass of Parnassus. And when you finally find it, it's just okay. But look for lies and you will see them everywhere, like the melancholy thistle, erect spineless herb of the sunflower family. That the eradication of desire promotes peace and lengthens life is time-honored counsel. Still, you can't simply wait until you feel like it. The beauty of the Campion's bladder and sea, the tough little sea rocket, is their effort in spite of, I want to say, everything. Though they know nothing of what we mean when we say everything, it is a sentiment referring only to itself. Purple toad flax, common mouse ear, orchids, trefoils, buttercup, self-heal, the Adoxa moscatellina it's too late in the year for. I can hardly stand to look at them. And all identified after the fact, but for the banks of wild roses, the poppies you loved parked like an ambulance by the barley field. Thanks so much for listening. That was so wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Um, this this is my first visit to Canada. I'm very excited <laughs> to be here. Um, <laughs> and thank you so much um, to Sina for organizing this. And um, it's such an honor um, to be reading with Karen. Um, I, I, in fact, if you want to look at my sort of Facebook page, um, everyone I know is so excited that I'm reading with Karen Soli. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited myself. Um, so I thought I would read a, a couple of poems, um, put on my reading glasses, a couple of poems from Like, um, which is my, my latest collection, um, and some uncollected newish poems, um, since I don't often get a chance to try them out um, on a new audience. Um, in some ways, I think uh, Like is organized on the sort of opposite end of the spectrum from Capely Caves, um, just in terms that it's organized by the alphabet. Um, rather than around um, a place and, and a person. Um, but uh, I hope that there are some, some ways that the poems interact. This first poem is called um, Empathy and has to do with um, living in Greece as I do in 2016. There was um, a great influx of refugees um, from Syria, but also from Afghanistan and other places. And there was a period when there were just lots and lots of drownings um, that were happening almost every day. And a lot of them were children. I have two children. Um, and how I, it started to infiltrate, I think, even my subconscious and my dreams. But then how do you write about that? This is not my experience. This is my reaction to someone else's experience. So I thought exploring what that means with, with empathy might, might do something like that. So this is called Empathy. My love, I'm grateful tonight. Our listing bed isn't a raft, precariously adrift as we dodge the Coast Guard light and clasp hold of a, of a girl and a boy. I'm glad we didn't wake our kids in the thin hours to take not a thing, not a favorite toy, and didn't hand over our cash to one of the smuggling rackets that we didn't buy cheap life jackets no better than bright orange trash and less buoyant. I'm glad that the dark above us is not deeply twinned beneath us and moiled with wind, and we don't scan the sky for a mark, any mark that demarcates a shore as the dinghy starts taking on water. I'm glad that our six-year-old daughter who can't swim 
is a foot off the floor in the bottom bunk and our son with his broken arms high and dry, that the ceiling is not seeping sky with our journey, but hardly begun. Empathy isn't generous, it's selfish. It's not being nice to say I would pay any price not to be those who die to be us. One of the great advantages of organizing poems in alphabetical order is they're really easy to follow. Um, especially to reading. Um, so this poem is, I think I have certain modes. Um, some are maybe mythological, some are mytho-domestic, I'd like to call them. And this is, this is in, that, in that mode. And it's called Scissors. Scissors are singular and plural. Uncanny, one plus one is one. Even in solitude, a pair, cheek to cheek or on a tear, knives at cross purposes, bereaving cleavers to each other cleaving, open, shut, give and take, all dichotomy in their wake. What starts with size concludes in oars, his or hers, mine or yours, divvy up, slice clean, slice deep in pinked jags or one swift sweep, the crisp sheet where they met and married, the paper where the blades are buried. And I thought I'd read a couple of um, published but uncollected poems, two or three poems. Um, so some of these are either just on the cusp of our pandemic life, um, and seem to kind of look forward to that in this way that poems have, I think, of being prophetic, or, you know, or turning out to be prophetic. And some are maybe about that, that claustrophobic time that some of us are still in. The first is called Deedle, D-A-E-D-A-L, um, like Daedalus, Icarus and Daedalus. Um, and it does happen to be a villanelle for those who are, you know, keeping track for the bingo players at home. Um, so you'll hear lines repeat and two rhyme sounds. Um, and it is about labyrinths and creation. Um, so I hope that the form, you know, says something, converses with the, the subject matter. To build a labyrinth, it takes a twisted mind, a puzzled art, a fractal branching of mistakes, Drag out the shovels and the rakes, the spirit level, sacred chart. To build a labyrinth, it takes shadows, stones, a way that snakes and ladders to its shaky start, an average mazing of mistakes, the kind that everybody makes, set random intervals apart. To build a labyrinth, it takes dead ends that seem like lucky breaks the paths of bats that weave and dart through limestone caverns of mistakes. The shaken etch-a-sketch awakes, a lost child buried in its heart. To build a labyrinth, it takes some good intentions, some mistakes. Um, so I had not ever written a, a guzzle before, um, maybe something about the again, the kind of claustrophobic and repetitive nature of particularly last year kind of lent itself to this, to this form. And I particularly enjoy writing a form for the first time because I think it's sort of, um, my brain is really pleasantly engaged with solving the technical problems in a way that frees up the con subconscious more. When I, I get too good at them, there's always the, the problem, I think, of becoming glib or, you know, making it too easy. So this was kind of, that sweet spot, I, I think. I'm not sure I would write another one. Um, and it's called the Ghazal, the Ghazal of the 50th Danaid. And the Danaids were um, 50 women um, in ancient Greek mythology. They're actually Egyptian um, who are forced to marry their cousins and 49 of them um, who are unhappy with the situation kill their husbands um, on their wedding night. But then there's the other one. <laughs> and their punishment in hell um, or in the Greek version of hell, is that they have to fill, they're like the female version of Sisyphus. 
they have to fill a sieve over and over again that of course will never fill, which, you know, I think a lot of us can, can sympathize with that. So, and you'll hear again, a lot of repetition and a lot of repeated rhymes. The Ghazal of the 50th Danad. Sisters, infernal virgins, would you kill again, knowing the endless sieves you would refill again? Night is where the day's mistakes repeat. I swallow the bitter crumb, the sleeping pill again. Isn't the womb, the, sie the sieve, the moon, the spring from which blood's phases rise and fill and spill again? I carried thrice, bore twice, and once I grieved and shouldered my vessel up the morning's hill again. Dawn is a murderess, her hands stained pink. She slips in guiltily over the windowsill again. The arsenic hour, the, arguments, the argument resumes, our heated words then silences smooth chill again. November and the leaves flush red with shame. It's just the autumn draining the chlorophyll again. The night sky is the hull of a sinking boat. Stars are the silver holes that drill and thrill again. Beauty leaks away, the face burns hot. Youth is the liquor no one can distill again. I steep and brew a bitter wakefulness. The kitchen's nowhere engine whistles shrill again. At 50, the matron turns from the fickle moon and is not subject to her tyrant will again. Perhaps it's stalling, flipping the hourglass. I watch today's gold grains tick down to nil again. And um, Sina had mentioned the, the peacock tweets. Um, so some of the, not all of the pandemic, but some of the lockdowns, I was um, on an island, um, a Greek island, um, which has a Greek island problem, Greek island problems. Um, it has a plague of feral peacocks, um, which doesn't, I mean, you know, it's a beautiful problem, but uh, it's a loud and also annoying problem. So um, at least they're, so they're, they've now become my nightingales. My, my other poets have nightingales. I have peacocks. They're my, my loud and garish muses. Um, so this is entitled Peacocks and has an epigraph from James Merrill. I speak to the unbeautiful in this bird. <laughs> the peacock thinks he can't be seen. Stealthily towards the cat food bowl he stalks while I'm behind the screen, coffee in hand, peacock patrol. More blue than the saronic green as bristles on Aleppo pines, perhaps he thinks he only blends. And often as the day declines, a raucous mob of fowl ascends to virid roosts while dusk defines the drooped flabella of their tails and flails of needles just the same, the perfect camouflage for males, it turns out. Neither wild nor tame, the feral population hails from elsewhere. Someone brought them here, but no one keeps them, and they breed. Each spring, new chicks, chickpeas appear. They'll gobble anything. They'll feed on cat food, tulip bulbs. They smear flagstones with shit. On lizard feet, Jurassic more than Pleistocene, he creeps back. And I let him eat to watch the iridescent sheen a hundred irises repeat. But also note the lapis crown, Egyptian coal mascarid eyes, his zebra wings, the russet brown beneath. He rustles with surprise, train trailing like an evening gown when I go shoo him off again. Some mornings I have heard a rattle like a shock of summer rain when one fanned out vibrates for battle with a false twin in the window pane. When he absconds, he leaves behind a duller shade, a haunt of blue, a dazzled blind spot in the mind. I've read that science says the hue is something that you will not find peering through microscopes. There's no true blue to dye his plumes despite the afterburn of indigo. It's all a trick of light, a slight of keratin arranged just so, armored in light, in light arrayed, a cloak of visibility. They say the color will not fade because it is not there to see. 
the brilliance new because new made by shedding light by flash and flaunt sly peacock back again for scraps dismissive gestures seem to daunt he bustles off with little flaps like taffeta and debutante thank you It was wonderful to to hear these these poems, Karen, that I've been um, that I've been reading and enjoying, and um, and it kind of started to answer one of the questions that I had in, in some because uh, for me I think the the a, a difficulty it can be for a poet um, like in a new landscape or place. There's always this fear of maybe writing like travel poetry or tourist poetry. And I mean, if I didn't know more about your background, I would have thought these poems about the Scottish and the Firth of Forth and all of this, they, they seem like someone who has lived there forever. There's just a, a texture to them um, and the language and, and maybe the points of view that seem to be very much of the place rather than looking at it, and I was fascinated about how it came about that you were wandering and writing the book. Oh well, um, thanks for that, I, and thanks for that reading. That was uh, so so great. Um, you know the the thing about I've always really come to ideas and and. Um, and poetry really through place, but there was a real concern about writing a place that was not my place. Um, I suppose the, the, the way in for me was um, both um, an interest in the place in the notion of um, this figure who was trying to decide whether to become a, a public person and establish this priory, which was a community that would welcome people or to remain in solitude. And so that was kind of a, a conceptual way in. I did a lot of, of research while I was there. I, um, I ran across the caves while I was right in residence in St. Andrews and uh, just wanted to find out more about them. And that's really where the whole process started. I just kind of started following my nose and finding out more about about this figure, Etherton, um, about the the history of the place, about the history of Christian colonialism at that time. I was raised Catholic, so that that was another way in to sort of um, think about uh, think about the forces wrapped up in in Catholicism, which uh, in the seventh century the church was really coming into itself as a as a kind of money making venture and a, and a source of power. So that dovetailed with notions of work and, and uh, impacts on the natural world and decision-making and all of that. So I just started to, I went to traipsed around and went to little museums and little villages. I, I you know, went to galleries, I, I, I talked to people, um, just kind of um, followed my nose and, and a lot of the poems came out of that. So um, it, involved, it involved a lot of, a lot of research in order to get get things right. There are some things that, that a person can make up and then other things that need, need to be need to be correct as far as as far as we know. So so that uh, that was sort of a, a way into into the the place for me. But I, I appreciate you that you that you felt it was that it felt you know situated that it did feel somewhat located because it, it was a concern for me when I was writing the book. Can I ask you, um, I'm, I'm glad you read the Peacock poem, which I really, which I read recently and really enjoyed. And so um, this is sort of diverges from place, but it, but when I was writing the book and, and throughout the books that I've written, I've always been really interested in how one communicates uncertainty and doubt. And in your work, this is, um, involved for me anyway very much with 
with form and with, with rhyme and with meter, which feel in a way like we can feel as poets that, that or as readers maybe that there's a, there's a kind of a, a certainty to that. There's a, there's a kind of, you know, a guiding principle um, um, and established forms are, are, are sort of um, guideposts uh, for us. But I'm curious to ask you how you feel the poetic form and rhyme express the uncertainty and the doubt that I see in, in a lot of the work. I mean, the line in the Peacock poem, um, the, color, uh, the color doesn't fade because it isn't there to begin with. Like that opens up a huge, a huge question about perception and about, you know, about the real. So um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about how you navigate uncertainty and doubt and, and what form and, and rhyme and repetition and regularity allow in that respect. I mean, I, I think it can probably work the other way where, you know, something can be rhymed and that could make something that's not certain sound more certain. Um, you know, I, I think for me, when rhyme and meter are working, it is a way of holding things in kind of like a sonic balance um, where they may be wildly, you know, not in balance in some other ways and a way of... Um, of moving forward in a poem and kind of feeling one's way. And, you know, I do think that um, rhyme can work as kind of almost echolocation where you're sort of sounding a word out and seeing what what kind of comes back to you. And, it, you know, it does allow for, I think it allows things to stay in a kind of, um, you know, cognitive dissonance be just because it actually, it you know, resolves just in the sound, it somehow allows the thing to hold, um, to hold together, as it were, instead of to collapse. I don't, that may be not very articulate, but um, I, for me, when when it's working, and as again, it doesn't always work. Um, it is about kind of feeling my way as I'm thinking, and I think that rhyme and meter can help with that. I mean, they can also be a, a crutch, I guess. Um, you know, if you're doing something, again, if it can become, if it becomes glib or too easy or, you know, a default thing. Um, so usually I am kind of trying to, uh, be, like in the Peacock poem, the stanzas are five lines. I like the oddness of the lines because that's kind of an unbalance. Um, and, you know, only some of the things I think are, are rhymed. Oh no, maybe they're all rhymed. Okay, I take that back. Um, you know, so I, I love it when there's a formal element that is really quite disciplined, but um, there's also something that's very unstable, you know, like rhymes are going across stances or, you know, there's enjambment or, um, so I like having that sort of tension, um, but I'm, I'm not sure I can really articulate that, but I, I am very interested in, in, in doubt and, um, you know, things that don't result. I mean, I think that's, that's a lot of what poetry is interested in, um, is things that we have trouble articulating. And so they end up, you know, being in a metaphorical space or some other kind of thing where, where you can kind of hold that dissonant thought on the page and it doesn't have to resolve. I don't know. I don't know how you feel about that with, um, cause you, you know, you, I, 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 reading your poems, I mean, I just feel very envious because I, I, I love that it has this feeling of, um, you know, tightness. There's a feeling that there have been very hard decisions made about, um, you know, sounds. And, and I, I'm very attracted to things that, you know, are kind of punning, but are actually more interesting than that. I mean, I think puns kind of get a, a bad rap as the lowest form of wit, because I think they're also the highest form of wit, maybe at the same time, if they're, you know, playing for higher stakes, you know, whether it's the, the ambient and the ambient, you know, that like that, I love that sort of thing where it's almost like a etymological figure. Um, and I, so I envy, I envy the, <laughs> I envy what you do. I feel like when I, when I'm reading your poems, it makes me want to go and write better. So that's always a good sign. <laughs> oh, well, likewise, I can, likewise, I'm, um, and I, and I agree with it. And 
the puns, I mean, that's true. And, and it's, it's true with so much of poetry that it, it's like, there's two opposites that are, that are true at the same time, or, or two seeming opposites that are true at the same time, you know, it's like, uh, um, uh, yeah, every, you know, anything, anything can work, the sky's the limit and, and until it, it, until it doesn't work, but there's no way to find out before it's on the page that you can't determine anything really. Um, but the, you know, that so much is about curiosity, isn't it? Like, and I, and I see that in your poems, like through the, and, and when you were speaking about, about how, um, how you, you, you move through and, and negotiate the, the structural elements of the poem. I mean, there's, there's surprise there even you know when when you're working with regularity and, and repetition and rhyme and 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 and, um, and rhythm and all of those all of those devices, it's almost like that that those are the means by which we surprise ourselves. That kind of the where those variations pop up and it allows it allows one to follow one's curiosity because there's a I feel like. I don't, I don't know, like for me, there's an element of, of when one finds the, um, you know, those stones across the river that a poem is kind of in the, you know, the dangerous water and, and things that when one finds that path through the poem, it, it it's hard to know, you know, you might go, you might end up a place that you you didn't intend. Like there's a there's a one can follow one's curiosity through these these uh, repetitions and regularities, which I, I which never fails to to fascinate me as a reader as as well as as a writer. I think I think Brian Eno somewhere says that um, repetition is a form of change, which I I I think that's. It's one of those things that, you know, even if a line is just completely repeated verbatim, something will have happened, you know, even, even to the reader who's sitting there, five seconds have passed, you know, maybe they've been bitten by a mosquito. It doesn't mean the same thing because it, it has moved through time. Um, so I'm very fascinated with those sorts of things. I loved your, your image about the, you know, hopping on the stones. I now am picturing the sort of, sort of, Bog, like in the Hound of the Baskervilles, <laughs> you have to, like you're following butterflies and you're leaping from from thing to thing, but you know you could end up sinking. <laughs> you could end up catching the butterfly. You don't know. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the. I mean, I think that's also. I don't know if you feel this, but um, that's also in a way what can make poetry feel. I almost feel like it. Not exactly that it gets harder, but you know, it's 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 not something that gets easier with practice because it the more you know the more you do it the more you realize, oh, I, I have to recreate conditions where this has to be completely new again. And, you know, that, that's not always easy. You know, it, if you're, it's one of the things I find if I'm exploring like a new form, you know, it, that if it's really quite fresh to me, the, the technical problems that it, it frees something up. And if I'm quite familiar with the technical problems, I'll have to throw in something else. Um, to not, you know, kind of go on autopilot, which is always death to any, any poem or I imagine any artistic performance. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know if you find that, but I find in some ways, like maybe as you get older also and, and revise more, you're, you become maybe a little bit more conscious of how you do it and you have to somehow block that. <laughs> you know, like to not, you know, be thinking overhead what to do, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's always, you know, you're always, as a poet, discovering, you're engaging with, with not only what is thought about, but how we think, and, and, um, and, you know, perception, cognition, all of that, you know, you're, you're engaging with all of that in a poem, and um, there is the, certainly, I felt like it's, it's become harder. Uh, as I've as I've gone along, because again, you know, some of those things that feel like they're that they're um, in opposition are, are true at the same time. We're always told, you know, we must when we're young poets, we have to find our voice. But then, you know, as it goes along, it's like, 
well, once I find it, then what? Is that it? <laughs> no, does the whole thing just grind to a halt? And so that there's always that, you know, paying attention to the idiosyncrasies of one's own thought, which is really important and, and sort of following that with curiosity, but also really not wanting to get on rails with that and really wanting to always see where, you know, see where else it could go. And uh, so that, you know, that's always, that's always intention and it does, does sort of, I don't know, become, become more complicated or become more pressing or something as, as, as things go on. But it also gets more interesting, I think. Yeah. Um, was it a lot different? I mean, doing more of a, of a project book, was that a just, did that come together kind of in some ways after the fact? And then you're like, oh, there's an organizing principle to this or exploring from like outward and I, I loved the just the simple use of the justification the right justification to kind of indicate these are kind of other thoughts or I, I thought that was a very elegant and and kind of easy way to sort of separate the the registers of the poems or, or I'm not sure how to better phrase that. Well, I appreciate you saying that because it was a ridiculous process. I tried so many different things to try and to try and allow that voice to to sound like it did in my head. And um, and oh, God, I tried I tried almost everything and it was all terrible. And once I once I just moved them, then then that felt closer and the double spacing felt closer. And then I could feel like I could work with the line a little bit more. Um, once I had that tone, the project book thing was, oh my God, I spent so much time thinking that it was a really bad idea. Um, it did, it did occur to me initially as, as a thing, which has never happened to me before. And I resisted it for a long time because I thought, oh God, you know, here comes the middle-aged project book, right? That everybody was warning me about. <laughs> and Eureka, there it is. But um, so yeah, it was a, I was deeply interested in pursuing it at the same time. I didn't feel like I knew what I was doing. I thought it was possibly a terrible idea. Um, so I just, I don't know. I just thought, well, what else am I going to do? I might as well do what interests me. Might as well see what happens. So um, that's kind of the way I, that's kind of the way I worked through it. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a kind of a frightening process. Um, because it has to be though, doesn't it? That's the thing. It's you know, if it if it isn't a little bit frightening, then that's itself a problem. It is, yeah. Because you know, what's the point then? Just you know, it has to. It has. There has to be something at stake. Um, so yeah, it it is. A person might you know. I don't. As a poet, once in a while, just like, can one thing be easy? Can one thing be like? <laughs> Self-evident and certain, just one thing, but uh, yeah, apparently, apparently not. Um, what did, how do you go about structuring a collection? The the like is has a has a sort of guiding principle. Did that did that occur to you, you know, um, before you embarked on the book, or was that something that evolved? Well, the, it so far, I mean. My books and poems have just kind of accrued. They just kind of accrue. But I mean, I guess because they accrue during a, a period of time, you know, one has certain concerns. You know, you don't necessarily see it that way at the time. But obviously, you know, if you're writing poems over five, six years, they're going to be about that, whatever you are going through, you know, at that time. Um, but I just had this sense of I wanted, I, I kind of just, I didn't want to have like the poem and the book in sections thing, you know, like the, the four sections or the five sections, um, you know, kind of the movements. I, and I, I just didn't feel like the poems worked that way in this case. And I just, I became obsessed with the idea of just doing it in this random alphabetical order. And, um, you know, of course, other books have been done in, in alphabetical order um, by titles or, or, or by other, other elements. Um, and I just, through the things in alphabetical order, and I was amazed that they worked. Which is that my feeling, you know, that the uh, the muses and the universe and things are are out there, and they're, you know, they are beyond our control, and we need to listen to them sometimes. 
Um, and it was just kind of amazing how things abutted each other, or things that I wouldn't have put together, but seemed to speak, I would have done something more artificial or I don't know, but it, it seemed to work. There were only maybe two poems that really did not fit in their alphabetical slot. And I just, I changed the titles, I just changed the titles and <laughs> stick them somewhere else. But otherwise it, um, you know, and it, it seems sort of almost a, a magical system. I, I, I'm not even sure I would go back from that. Maybe I'll do all this. I mean, it is so much easier, like in a reading, I just like flip to S. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and I think I was thinking about, you know, the magic of the alphabet also in other ways, maybe at that time I was doing some translation and so forth and just thinking about the alphabet as, a, as an almost a kind of a magical charm, which it is. And, um, but it was, it was one of those things where it's like, you think, is this a stupid idea? Is this crazy? And then you put it together and like, no, I think it works. You know, I almost think in some ways that these, you know, these experiments, which, you know, I think all, all poems are, um, is it Wallace Stevens who said that? Um, but I started thinking about, it's a bit, you know, like Frankenstein, you put these pieces together and then you hope that they become alive. They don't always, so sometimes it's just, pieces of things sewn together, but sometimes, you know, the, the lightning strikes and it's, you know, it's a lie. Um, but, you know, that's not necessarily something I have control over. I have control over some other things, but, but I like that element of not, not having control. That's, that's the thing I, I like about forms of various kinds is it's giving over some sort of control and I can focus on other things. And I like that element of handing that over to, the universe or the muse or something else you know i i think i if i'm in control of every aspect of the poem i'm just become paralyzed i like to have some some sort of random controls yeah well it, it is that it is a frankensteiny thing because there is that you know the the expertise that comes with sewing all the pieces together you know that's that's it's almost like what creates the lightning like the magic arises out of these technical elements and so it can feel very much about technique and about and about you know um, syntax and about uh, and about line breaks and about formal concerns and at the same time from those from that discipline arises this magic and it and it almost like when when you were when you were just speaking those moments for us as writers when you know you put two things in proximity and suddenly you know something happens between them that one didn't anticipate it's like being a reader and and um and coming across a poem with two lines in proximity and it's just like what the hell is happening with between these two lines like why am i feeling this way because it doesn't seem to literally be there and so feeling that magic that we experience as a reader occur in a poem that's I mean that's that's what gets us all hooked I think is when we when we do what we it's got to release some serious dopamine yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 uh, yeah it's uh that that um coincidence of discipline and technique and magic are are intoxicating um yeah yeah I I don't know how we are. How are we doing for time? I could blather on. I have like a list of things to ask you, but um, I, I think, how are we doing, Zina? You have two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Good oh, grief. Yeah. Yes. I maybe could get you to speak a little bit about, or if you feel like it, the relationship between, I mean, you have this beautiful, um, we're just talking about the chants. Can you just talk briefly, just for two seconds, about the relate if you see a relationship or how you work the relationship between words in your, if anything comes to mind, this chance relationship between words. It's just something I noticed about both of your poems that is really astounding. When we were talking about it in my undergraduate class, just the chance of words. Can you anything to say about that? <laughs> well, I guess, you know, I, 
the questions that you you sent us from students were really remarkable. I think we could do another hour easily answering those or addressing those questions because they're really great. And it kind of comes up um, in, in, in one of the questions. And I like, um, <clears throat> Uh, I like syllables. I like sound. And and when I'm when I'm looking for a word, I'm looking for what the word means. But I'm also looking for the way it sounds and also the way it moves within the context of the other line. And so looking for for something through those two things simultaneously can sometimes lead me to a word that I didn't that I wouldn't have expected just because, you know, I want a three syllable word here and I want this pointy sound or I want this long sound. And so in that search, um, sometimes once in a blue moon, we'll come up with something that, that is a little off kilter perhaps meaning wise and that interacts within the line in a, in a strange way that I, that I kind of like. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Thank you. I just wanted to- I mean, I Sorry. I mean, I, I would second all of that. I mean, and in fact, I, I think one of the things with Karen's poems that I'm, I am myself fascinated with is um, I love um, when they're very technical. I love the register shifts when they're very technical words, when they're very prosy words. I, I, it always gives me a thrill when I see like a technical word or a prosy. I, when I see a word that I wouldn't expect in a poem, I love that. That's, that's something that I, I even try to strive for myself. It's like, have I ever put this word in a poem before? I should put this poem, this word in a poem. Um, and sometimes it is, you know, in that revision period where that magical thing happens. I mean, like for instance, in the Deedle Villanelle, um, the, the etch -a sketch which I think is the moment that, that clicks the poem and does something, that was not there originally. Something needed to be there and I was searching for something. And I think all of the, the, the sounds in the poem that were kind of dry, you know, ch -ch -ch kind of sounds and sounded even like how an Etch-a-Sketch, I think Karen and I are kind of similar, um, Generation X kind of, uh, that sound and that sound opened up the idea and then the idea clicks back open through the poem. And that's, I think a lot of maybe getting more experience in revision is knowing when to put something that doesn't seem to belong and when to leave it there. Excellent. Thank you. That was a great final, uh, final uh, answer and knowing when to leave it there. Thank you so much, both of you. What an incredible opportunity to see you on the same screen. Thank you for making it happen. Thank you for everybody for coming. Thank you, Anna, for recording. Um, well, I love both of your work. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. I don't know, Karen and uh, Alicia, if you can hear, but you are getting in-house applause. So, <laughs> and you're certainly getting a lot of um, great comments in the chat on Zoom. And I, I hope you have a moment to look through those before we close up. So a lot of people are really grateful to have been in the space with you, um, you know, participate in the readings, but also in the conversation. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciated it. And thanks for, to Sina for bringing this project to us here in the fourth space and to all the students and folks who attended uh, in person. It's great to have you in here with us. All right, so in a few seconds, we will close up the webinar. I'm just, I'm biding time so that you can look through the chat and, <laughs> and see, see all the comments coming in. Um, but uh, we do invite you to um, follow up by checking out the recording. So I did mention this at, at the start. I know some people might have missed it. If you just look up Concordia University Fourth Space on YouTube, you'll find our YouTube channel where we stream and, and record um, all of our events. So if you missed today's event or want to share it with your grandma or colleague or whomever, please go ahead and head over there for that recording. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oh.